Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. If you're coming from the East Coast, I know it's late morning, but still AM over there. Um, while people are trickling in, we've just got uh, a couple little polls for you guys to interact with so we can get a few in the audience today. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, I've got um, one poll that should be running right now, trying to figure out where <laughs> joining us from geographically. I'm just going to let that keep running for a little bit while we get some more answers in. All right, looks like a large majority of you have voted. Um, and results are coming in 28% from the Northeast. 38% uh, of you are joining from the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, looks like someone just said they're from the Southeast uh, and 31% from the mid Midwest. Well, looks like we're up to 41% Mid-Atlantic now. So we've got a good thread from across the country. Thanks for joining us, uh, wherever you're joining us from today. And I've got one more for you, just so you can get a feel for who's all out there and what kind of background knowledge you guys have about water quality in general. All right, we're got about 83% of the 85% of the audience has voted now. All right, now we're above 90. I'll just go through from top to bottom. 8% of you said the first option, you're pretty new to this. 16% of you said no field experience, but you know the basics. 43% say you have some prior training, education, or experience. 16% uh, say that you're a trained SOS monitor, and 21% of us are professionals in the water quality field this morning. So it looks like we got a pretty healthy spread. Um, about half our audience looks like they chose the middle option, have some prior training or experience. All right, and with that, that concludes our polls. So I'm not gonna be bugging you guys anymore to press any buttons or answer any questions. Um, but uh, we can go ahead and get started with some housekeeping items, first of all. Uh, so the webinar will be recorded. Uh, stay tuned to your email inbox probably early next week for a link to the YouTube video. Um, it'll get posted to our Isaac Walton League YouTube channel. And if you guys aren't familiar with GoToWebinar, we don't have the chat function like you do with Zoom where you can talk to other attendees. Uh, all we have is a questions uh, drop-down box. It should be most likely on the right side of your screen in your little control panel. So while Kim and Allison are presenting, you can go ahead and submit questions um, during the presentations or um, at the end, but just let them keep coming in during the during the presentations. And at the end, we'll do some Q&A for both, uh, both presentations. So um, I will be kind of in the background moderating and, and clicking slides forward and things like that. So you can send me a chat if you have any questions or concerns specifically um, that you want addressed. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's all of our housekeeping things. So we can go ahead and get started. Today we've got Kim Bogenschutz and Allison Zock uh, coming to us from uh, the Iowa DNR and then Nebraska Game and Parks and UNL. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the stage over to Kim to get started on her presentation. And I'm going to turn off my camera and mic and just be hanging out in the background. Okay, well, thanks, Zach. You can flip to my first slide if you want. And I'll introduce myself a little bit more. So um, I am the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Coordinator for the Iowa DNR. I have been in this position for 21 years now. 
Um, and I, I do all things that are aquatic invasive, zebra mussels, Eurasian water milk oil plants, but um, being in the heart of um, the Midwest, Mississippi River on one side, Missouri River on one side of our borders, um, do a lot of work with Asian carp. And so when Allison and I were, were deciding um, how we were gonna split this presentation up today, I said, you know what, I'll take Asian carp and she's gonna take zebra mussels. And so, um, and these are just two of the aquatic invasive species um, that we have here in the United States. And it's great to see that we have a, a, a broad audience today, both geographically and and um, experience wise. And so hopefully um, you have questions as I go along. Um, but as part of my job um, as the as the invasive species coordinator for the Iowa DNR, I am on the Upper Mississippi River Asian Carp Team, the Missouri River um, Basin Asian Carp Team. I'm on the ANS Task Force. So lots of coordination amongst uh, the country when we talk about Asian Carp. And so I am going to talk mostly about big head and silver carp today. Um, grass carp and black carp are included in the general category of Asian carp um, that we address across the country as part of our national management plan. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'm gonna stick to those two just for time wise. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about identification, their ecology and, and how they got here and their distribution, what their impacts are to our waters and our water quality, and then a little Bit about the research and management that's going on um, right now with Asian carp in the United States. So you can go to the next slide, Zach, please. <clears throat> All right, so, <clears throat> excuse me, allergies. Um, big head and silver carp. Those of you who are familiar with like the common carp, the German carp that have been in the United States for many, many years, these don't look anything like them. Um, so that is a big head carp on, on the left, the darker of the two, and a silver carp on the right. So these fish are, they're not as round and robust. They're laterally compressed and they're big. They can get to be really big fish. And if you're familiar with our common carp um, and or like grass carp, which are legal in some states, they have really big scales. Well, the big head and silver carp have really tiny little scales, more like trout. So little tiny scales um, on their deep bodies. They have really big mouths, particularly the big head. Um, and then there, there's no teeth, they're plankton feeders, and I'll talk a little bit more about their biology and ecology um, next. But so they have these big mouths that are low set, and then their eyes are set down low too um, on their heads almost like their heads are on upside down. Um, when, when big head and silver carp were first being documented in the upper Midwest anyway, people would be like, I caught this really ugly fish and I don't know what it is. And I'd be like, mm, probably a big head or a silver carp. Um, so this is what they look like. I'll, I'll have um, more pictures um, as we go along. Um, but next slide, please. So a little bit about their ecology and how they were introduced into the United States. So both species are native to rivers, generally big rivers of Eastern Asia, um, including parts of Russia and China. Their native ranges are a little bit different um, over in Asia, but basically overlap. So they're big river fish um, and they consume phytoplankton and zooplankton. So they have these really big mouths. They just swim through the water with their mouths open, um, siphoning plankton. And that's how they survive and grow to really big sizes. Um, there is a little bit of difference. One of the ways you can identify big head versus silver is with their gill rakers. There's a difference in those and the sizes of plankton that they consume. But both species get really large, but the big heads in particular can get to be up to 55 inches in length and over 100 pounds. Um, the current state record big head in Iowa right now is just over 106 pounds. 
And when I give talks to like school groups, I'm like that, that fish weighs more than you, you know, when you're talking to little kids. So that really like gets them like, wow, these fish are huge. And all they're doing is filtering plankton out of the water. Um, and so they were first imported into the United States legally. Um, they were allowed to be brought in um, by, by a private fish farmer in Arkansas and, and subsequently other fish farmers brought them in for plankton control. Um, they found out that these fish take a lot of plankton out of the water, would clear up their ponds, um, and so they imported them. Well, unfortunately, a lot of the aquaculture um, ponds in Arkansas and Mississippi are in the Mississippi River Basin. And when we get a lot of rain, rivers flood, ponds get flooded, so they escaped out that way. Some may have been um, released into um, private ponds or, or other things as well. Even the federal government at one point in time was looking at you know, the possibility of using big head and silver carp for plankton control. Um, so anyway, so they've escaped um, by about the 1980s and were discovered in our natural waters. And basically since then, they've been swimming up and down the Mississippi River and its tributaries. Um, they do naturally reproduce in our rivers. Um, no documentation yet that they are reproducing in, in lakes, um, but they are spreading naturally. Um, and there's probably some human introduction as well um, up and down um, the Mississippi River Basin. So next slide, please. So this is, um, this, these maps are from the USGS, the US Geological Survey Bureau, um, just updated here um, in April of their current distribution. So the, um, the one on the left, the Molatrix is a silver carp. Um, the one on the bottom right, the Nobilis, is the big head carp. And so you can see their distribution is fairly similar. Um, big, head, big head carp are a little bit more widely distributed. They seem to be the ones that that is, you know, moved through first. They're kind of the first ones that we see, and then the silver carp um, go behind them. But, you know, you see the Mississippi River going up from Louisiana up into Minnesota, Missouri River going into the Dakotas, um, the Ohio River Basin. So there's, um, the only thing that, you know, will truly stop them from spreading on their own is a dam, you know, some sort of physical impasse like that. You know, you'll see the random locations out in other states. They have been stocked, um, but right now, unfortunately, they are um, spreading up and down the, the center part of the country on their own. So next slide, please. So what are their impacts? Well, like all invasive species and what makes something, you know, one of the characteristics of something being invasive is that their reproduction is super high. And these fish are, <clears throat> you'll see um, from that, the, the fish um, that in the bottom left corner there, at one point in time, that was our, our state record in Iowa, and that one was just over 79 pounds that that guy caught. Um, generally, they're caught by bow fishermen because they don't bite on, on bait, so the, but the bow fishermen love them. So anyway, that's probably a female fish. That whole lower the half of her body is eggs, more than likely. So they just they reproduce really high numbers, and then they grow to large sizes really quickly. Big head and silver carp can um, grow up to 12 inches in one year, and that puts them then out of the prey category, right? So there's not a lot of fish that are then going to be big enough to eat them. So they really high numbers grow really fast, and then they just kind of take over um, our waterways. Well, they're filter feeders, right? So they're competing with all of our other native filter feeders, includes fish like our paddlefish, big mouth and small mouth buffalo, um, gizzard shad. Also, mussels, our freshwater mussels are all filter feeders, and then you know, larval fish, all small fish. So when you think about 50 to 100 pound 
big head and silver carp swimming in rivers, the amount of food that they're taking out of our water um, is being removed for our native species. And we are seeing um, declines in the, um, the I'm lost for the word, but the condition of our native species. And even in the Missouri River, the condition of the big head and silver carp are declining because there's so many of them and um, they're taking out so much of the food. So leads to, um, you know, disrupting the food chain, depleting plankton populations for our native species. So that's, you know, kind of the whole ecological um, impact of big head and silver carp to our native species. But then they also have impacts on us, you know, humans as well. So they disrupt commercial fishing for the more profitable profitable species. So that middle picture there, there's some commercial fishermen on the Illinois River. Um, you know, our commercial fishermen, they like flathead catfish, they like buffalo, um, species like that. But there are parts of the rivers where all they get now are big head and silver carp. And you can see these guys, you know, they filled up their boat and their truck with big head and silver carp. Um, there is contracted commercial fishing. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on. But you know, so it's really impacted our commercial fishermen because there's not, they don't get paid much for the big head and silver carp. There's not much of a market for them um, yet. And then maybe some of you have seen the videos of the silver carp um, that jump out of the water. Um, we don't know why, we can't talk to the fish, but um, we think, you know, that, you know, probably it's the vibrations that they feel in the water from boat motors and things like that. They feel like a predator's coming. And so they just jump out of the water to try to escape. And so you can see um, that it happens. Like that's that's actually a USGS boat um, picture of the silver carp jumping behind that. But they jump into the boats, they jump behind them. And I'm like, you know, if you'd be water skiing or tubing, if people on jet skis have been hit, when we're out sampling, we get hit. Um, and we put up nets and things like that. So. And I say, you know, even if these are the little guys, even if these are the five to 10 pounders, it's still like a bowling ball that's going to come and smack you. So, you know, real impacts, people have been injured by getting hit with um, the silver carp. Um, so they have impacts both to our native species, but then also um, to us and the economy as well. So what are we doing about them? Um, next slide, please. So um, back in 2007, well, it was approved in 2007, but we started many years before that. Through the ANS Task Force, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service, with partners from multiple agencies from the private aquaculture industry, developed this the management and control plan for big head, black grass, and silver carps in the United States. Very hefty plan, like it's a book, right? But it's got objectives and, and actions and and items. And then what's happened is from that national plan, the individual basins, so like um, on the left, I have the upper Mississippi River and the Ohio River basins. On the, on the bottom right is the Missouri River basin. So partners from those river basins have taken the national plan drilled it down to fit our individual basin plans more specifically and with funding through GLRI, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, through uh, what we call WERDA, the Water Resources Reform and Development Act, money's been coming to the Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS and through grants to the states and um, universities to start working on what can we do about these things. Um, you know, there's nothing that kills an Asian carp that won't kill our native species. And so um, we're, we're, we're starting from scratch, trying to figure things out. So next slide, please. So these are just a very few examples of what is happening throughout the United States. And I, of course, am familiar with the upper Mississippi and Missouri River Basin um, specifically but out we always put prevention up at the top like if we can prevent them from spreading that's number one um 
because when we do have some really good controls or management options, the, the less waters that we have to do um, to deal with, the better. So, you know, wanting people to know what these are, um, preventing their spread, you know, they, they're min they look like other minnows when, when, you know, can be bait. So, so preventing their spread, um, but we're doing a lot of monitoring, um, not just for the adults, which are somewhat easier to be seen or to find, although they're hard, they're tough fit. They, they're net shy. They don't like to go into nets. They will jump over nets. They can see them. So we've, we've really had to adapt our sampling. And um, you know, when we electrofish, they just jump out of the water rather than come into our electrodes. So, um, but we're learning. We're learning new ways to, to, to sample them so we can monitor the adults. But also the the larval fish and the eggs to try to to document where they are spawning and reproducing. So if there's something that we could change there, um, so that they're not reproducing as much. Um, we're also, and when I say we, this is the big collective of all the agencies, um, monitoring fish passage at lock and dams. So for example, you know, the Mississippi River, it's a series of locks and dams. <clears throat> well, through um, monitoring and, and tagging, we know that they are locking through, um, for example, lock and dam 19 is at Keokuk, Iowa, the bottom, bottom corner of Iowa. All you gotta do is go across the river and you're in Illinois or Missouri. They can't get over the dam, it's a hydropower dam, but they can lock through and they do with barges. So we, we know that now. So, and they're doing, we're doing that at other places as well. How are these things getting past what we think would normally be a barrier? So then when we know when they're passing through or how they're getting through, we're trying to figure out, well now, how do we stop them? What type of barrier can we use? And there's, there's dams, um, there's electricity, um, the picture on the the bottom there is an electrical barrier below um, Lower Gar Lake, which is in the Spirit Okoboji chain of lakes in Iowa, um, kind of our premier uh, natural lake area in Iowa. And silver carp have and big head carp have gotten from the Missouri River up the Little Sioux River and into the lakes. And so now there's an electric barrier there trying to stop them. Um, at Lock and Dam 19, they're using complex sound barrier. We are just in the testing phase. I, I was over there Monday helping um, put the transmitters into the silver carp. When we tagged 131 fish in one day, it was a new record. It was great. It was so much fun. Um, but we're also putting them in native fish too to see, okay, if the sound will stop the big head and silver carp because it irritates them, will our native fish still go through? Um, and they're also working on carbon dioxide barriers. Um, there's carbon dioxide in the water, the fish can't breathe, so they don't move into there. So can we use that as a barrier to prevent them from moving? So um, lots of ongoing research um, with things like that. There's also some experimental techniques. And I can never pronounce this very well, but micro matrix pesticide delivery. So that's putting chemicals um, that kill fish but putting it in a little particle that the big head and silver carp will filter, and because they have a very unique gut system, it breaks it down and will kill them, but not our native fish. Um, we were lucky enough to have partner with them when they were testing this out. They were using some of our ponds um, at a, one of our fish rearing facility down in Rathbuns off the Sheraton River, so it's got big head and silver carp, but it also had paddlefish and buffalo, and and yeah, it killed the big heads and, and silvers and not the paddlefish and buffalo. So they're working on it experimentally, um, but then just physically removing them, harvest. So um, Illinois in particular, Minnesota as well, they pay contract fishermen to go out there and remove them, but it's also a way for us to monitor and detect, um, and then those fish. They're sometimes used for fertilizer. Sometimes they're used to feed osprey, things like that. And there's this harvest method. It's called the modified unified method. It's what's used in China. It's very labor intensive and a very long thing, but basically you, every day you just move and crowd fish 
until you get them to one confined area and then you can net them out. So lots of things that are ongoing, um, trying to figure out how these things are impacting, how these fish are impacting us, what we can do to monitor and control them. So um, that's a lot and a little bit of time about Asian carp. Um, Allison's gonna be up next talking about zebra mussels. Great, thank you, Kim. Um, Allison, if you're able, there you are. Um, all right, so now we've got Allison Zock joining us from Nebraska. She's, like Kim mentioned, gonna be talking about zebra mussels. Uh, so Allison, I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself and get started. You're still on mute. Thanks. Hi, everybody, my name's Allison Zock and I'm here in Lincoln, Nebraska. I work at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Um, my program is the Nebraska Invasive Species Program, which is a grant-funded program funding from the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and other donors. And I work with all taxa of invasive species. So um, my, my position is to conduct outreach and education on invasive species, but I also coordinate the Nebraska Invasive Species Council, which is comprised of all the experts in our state that do invasive species research, monitoring, and management. And so I'm um, very plugged in. And so if you ever are looking for a speaker on any invasive species, please keep me in mind. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna to talk to you about zebra and quagga mussels, and I'm gonna specifically talk about zebra mussels, um, but everything I, I'm gonna be speaking about applies to quaggas as well. Um, I just in Nebraska have zebra mussels, so I have experience with those. Um, these are both freshwater bivalve mollusks. They are native to um, Russia and Ukraine, the Black Sea and the lakes surrounding that. And so they can they can sustain themselves in um, both saline as well as fresh water. So they are pretty tolerant. Um, they do require certain levels of calcium in, in a water body um, to be able to form a shell. So one thing that we do with um, risk management is looking at water quality um, values to determine if um, water bodies would be suitable for their habitat. Um, they live on average two to five years. And on top here, we have the zebra mussel, and you see it has these stripes. And so that's how we, we think of it as a zebra mussel, like a zebra, it has stripes. Um, the stripes can look very different on, on different in, individuals, and, and sometimes they'll even look like a quagga mussel in terms of the, you know, the few numbers of stripes they have. Um, but they are more of a triangle shape versus our quagga mussels are more circular. And um, both of them are about the size of your thumbnail. They can get bigger than that if they have more food and, and depending on how dense their infestations are. Um, but normally with the size of a thumbnail, so pretty small. The adults and the juveniles, when the juveniles have a, are forming a shell, can live out of water for 30 days. Um, that's, that's with some caveats. That's depending on air temp and humidity. And we've actually found in heavily encrusted houseboats in Utah, They've ha they found live zebra mussels after um, six months because there's so many layers of zebra mussels on those houseboats. So um, they can live longer than that, but general generally in the summertime when it's hot outside, um, we like to have people clean, drain, dry for roughly two weeks um, just because of the, the heat that should um, heat everything up to not allow them to live um, that long out of water. And then the villagers, we'll talk more about those. Those are the larva. And they've actually looked at ballast um, the contents of ballast bags from wakeboard boats, and they found zebra mussel larvae living for up to 27 days in those ballasts. And so that's a big concern in terms of, if you're familiar with wakeboard boats, um, they hold a lot of water and it's not easy for them to completely drain all that water. So um, many different vectors, unfortunately, that these, these um, invasive mussels get around on watercrafts and other equipment. Next slide, please. So here's just um, size comparison for you. So I talked about the thumbnail for zebra and quagga mussels, and so they're on the top there. And you'll see that they'll actually um, attach to one another and to items like this. And so um, zebra mussels have these basal threads, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, and they have to glue themselves or attach themselves to a substrate, and then they filter feed, and that's how they live. Quagga mussels are, do not require that, and so actually they are more adaptable to more water bodies because they don't require that substrate to attach themselves to. Um, but on the bottom, I'm showing you a native mussel. And so native mussels are more like the size of your hand versus the zebra mussels are more of a th thumbnail um, size. Next slide, please. 
So zebra and quagga mussels have a lot of impacts. And so if you're a boater, um, zebra mussels are going to be a big deal to you because they can actually ruin your boat motor. Um, if you leave your motor in the water in a water body that has zebra and quagga mussels, the larva can swim into the intakes, they'll grow, and more and more will, will collect there and they will actually um, clog your, your intake so that that motor will not work. And so it will actually um, cause damage to your watercraft. They have extremely sharp shells, and so if you are at a water body with zebra or quagga mussels, you're going to have to wear um, water shoes because um, you will get cut, unfortunately. And so that's one of the big reasons that these um, invasive mussels are so bad for recreation because you you're just going to have thousands of shells on the on the shore and in the shallows, and so it makes it very hard for people to want to go swimming with their families there. Um, zebra and quagga mussels, they will filter feed a liter of water a day. And when you think of thousands of these mussels um, on the bottom of a water body filtering uh, water, it's pretty substantial. And so if we think of our native mussels that are really important because they also filter feed and clean our water bodies, um, on average, let's say in a water body, it would take two to three months for a native mussel to completely filter that whole lake. If you have an infestation or zebra quagga mussels, it's more like on a daily basis or on a weekly basis. And so it's just a much more rapid reduction of plankton availability for native um, fishes, game fishes, and other aquatic species. And so it, it has cascading effects because they are taking so much plankton out of the water column. There are, we, we spend trillions of dollars every year um, in industry working to remove zebra and quagga mussels. This is a picture of a power plant. Many power plants pull water from rivers um, or water bodies that have zebra quagga mussels, they then get in those facilities and start growing. And so then of course, um, they have to go in and physically remove them with power washing as pictured here, or on the right here, we have pipes. And so with those pipes, they're either gonna have to install a UV light system that will um, mutate those larvae, or they're gonna have to put chemicals in those systems. Um, both of those of course have a cost. And so even if you might not be a recreationalist person and say, I don't really care about lakes or or boats, so I'm, I'm fine with zebra mussels, I think you do care about your power bills. And so that's one thing that here in Nebraska, um, in the Omaha area, we've had to deal with um, some power plants. And so, um, yeah, definitely increases cost for those and other uh, municipal water plants. And then our native uh, mussels, of course, we have zebra mussels that, or quagga mussels that will attach to them. That's gonna keep them from being able to, um, to eat and, and filter feed. And so over time, they will actually kill our native mussels as well. And so um, very detrimental because native mussels are so important in our ecosystems. Next slide. So here's our life cycle of our, our zebra and quagga mussels. A single female will have up to a million eggs a year. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when the water temp is above 56 degrees Fahrenheit, males and females will start reproduction. The females will release eggs males release sperm, they will form larvae, we call villagers, and that's gonna be, after three to five days, those villagers are gonna be free floating in the water column. They're gonna be free floating for about two to three weeks until they start forming their shells, and then they'll get some weight to them, and then those zebra mussels are gonna have to find a substrate to attach themselves to, or they're gonna die, the zebra, and then the quagga mussels will find somewhere they need to settle. Um, but of course, 95% of these villagers are not gonna live through this stage. And so even though we have a million eggs, of course, 95% of those are not gonna make it. But when you have every female with a million eggs, you quickly have a water body full of zebra and quagga mussels. And so um, it's because of their voracious reproduction that we have a very hard time controlling these, these zebra and quagga mussels. Um, and so it's just something to think about all summer long when water temps are, are above 56 degrees, you potentially have these larvae free floating in the water column. And that's how they get in live wells and ballast um, tanks on, on wakeboard boats. Next slide, please. So I talked about cascading kind of impacts in an ecosystem. And what zebra mussels do is they're actually going to make air, uh, light penetrate deeper in the water column. So because each of these zebra mussels or quagga mussels are filter feeding a liter of water a day, you get a very clear water body. And many people might say, hey, I would love to live on a really clear lake. The problem with that is that can increase vegetation growth. And so with increased vegetation, of course, you are changing um, the, the habitat um, parameters for our desired um, 
fish and other species. And so, A, you're going to get more vegetation growth. The other change is you can actually have more blue-green algae um, blooms. And so blue-green algae is, of course, toxic to humans and animals. And they've actually found in the Great Lakes that it will um, aerosolize and people have actually increased rates of cancer from blue-green algae in the Great Lakes, which is attributed to these blue-green algae um, blooms. And so, unfortunately, it's not only that that it's you're getting more vegetation growth, but also that, ta that toxic algae exposure is increased. Next slide, please. So zebra mussels and, and quagga mussels are really good at hiding. So on the left, um, when we talk about talk to people about inspecting your boat and look for mussels, they think of mussels like you see on a dinner plate, right? Something big, something I'm going to see easily. But unfortunately, these zebra and quagga mussels like to hide in the nooks and crannies underneath your watercraft. And so um, it's going to be in, in those little housings, you know, that, that are there to protect different parts of the boat. And so when we inspect watercrafts, we definitely get dirty and we go underneath the boats and we really look and we use uh, lights and we use mirrors to actually inspect for this and so this is important when you're trying to educate people about clean draining and drying to understand that these are not easy to see these guys are dark in color and they're going to be in nooks and crannies <clears throat> and that's the adults the juveniles are actually invisible to the naked eye when they're in that water column so you're not going to see the the um, larva when you're when you're just looking at a water body but when they start forming them sh their shells they look gelatinous and that's what's pictured here on the bottom and so one thing when you're inspecting a watercraft is to actually feel um, where that water where that watercraft was in the water body and if it feels like sandpaper that could be villagers and so that's one of those um, risk factors we look for is do I feel something that feels like sandpaper that could be villagers um, on the side of that boat next slide please so this this um, this map is a little outdated, uh, but I liked it because it showed you kind of the uninfested West. And so when we talk about the uninfested West, we have a lot of programs out West, um, multi-million dollar prevention programs specifically for dry scented mussels, which are zebra and quagga mussels. And so if you took your boat from somewhere out East um, to let's say Colorado, your watercraft will be decontaminated and they will use hot water, high pressure to decontaminate to kill zebra and quagga mussels. And that's one of the reasons that they have not found them in their state is because they have such um, intensive programs. Now, when we look in, in the Midwest, um, which is where Kim and I are, are from, our programs are much smaller. Um, and so we, we depend on education um, as, as a real tool, as well as technicians to do inspections. But just wanted to bring up here the very big difference we have in terms of resources and prevention efforts on the ground um, in different parts of the United States. And so these mussels came over to us on ballast ships in the, in the late 1980s um, into the Great Lakes. And so from there, you'll see that's how, why we have this kind of movement is all from watercraft and other equipment that has been moved um, and those adults and those villagers get get a, around so easily unfortunately because they can can um, live out of water for a certain amount of time and so um, next slide please um, and you can just keep click and go ahead uh, yep perfect perfect um, so this is how most of us in in the Midwest and the West uh, sample for for zebra mussels using plankton nets and so if you're not familiar with the plankton net, it's going to have a, a small um, micron um, filter in it. And so it's going to allow most water to pass out except for small things the size of zebra mussel larva. And so um, when, when we throw out the net, we pull it back in and that's going to filter gallons of water. And so whatever's left in the cotton, which is on the right here, we pour into a bottle and then we look at, under a microscope, a cross polarized microscope to try to find the larva. So th this sampling method is literally finding a needle in a haystack. Unfortunately, our methods right now to detect these are very lacking because we have very large water bodies and these guys are so small. And, and they, of course, are putting out a lot of larva. But until you have quite a few um, adults reproducing, you're not going to find that larva. So I'll talk more about in the future. Um, hopefully we have better early detection. But this is currently the method that many of us use to water sample in the summertime. But then we also put out um, substrate samplers. So we'll put out pieces of metal or um, just something um, square-like, and then we'll put it in a water body and we'll monitor that throughout the year to see if we do find any um, zebra or quagga mussels growing on it. Next slide, please. 
So don't move a muscle. Um, it's all about clean, draining, and drying. And so this is the real education that um, Kim and I in our states and, and a lot of people use. And so the first thing is to let people know to, in, in, to inspect their water craft before leaving. So we want you to look for any attached plant material, mud, organisms, remove those, put those in the trash. Um, we want them just, just, you know, to not be going anywhere else. And then when we, and then also your drain plug. So if you have a, a watercraft with a live well, uh, we want you to look for a drain plug. And so you'll see on the bottom there, um, the drain plug you can remove, and that's going to remove all the water um, from those live wells and also um, your your motor. Uh, we want you to 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 um, exercise that as well. So there's some simple steps that we want people to use. Um, often people are confused, how do I prevent their spread? And it's clean, drain, and dry. So um, when you get home, make sure you clean that water that watercraft and the trailer so there's it's completely clean. Uh, let that dry for at least five days. Two weeks is better um, because we really want everything to be dry and those zebra mussel, uh, adults and larvae have no moisture to live. And then if you, when we talk about decontaminations, we're talking about high pressure, high temperature. And so based on research, we found that zebra mussel adults die at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. For 10 seconds and so when you go to one of these states that does decontaminations they're going to be using these these temperatures to clean the outside and the inside of your watercraft to remove and kill any adults and larvae the larvae of course are killed at a lower temperature um, and so that's what a decontamination is when you hear that word you can use vinegar so if you have a live well you can pour just vinegar you buy at the store in there soak it for 20 minutes or ropes or any equipment that you got wet in the lake um, soak it for 20 minutes um, and then you can keep that that vinegar and use it again so that's something that we use in the field um, to decontaminate our plankton nets would be vinegar and then also there's a table salt solution so you can just use table salt and, and water to soak those materials as well next slide please so what is being done um, there is a lot being done and so when we think about zebra mussels, often I'm asked, isn't it inevitable that we will just have them everywhere? And I'm happy to report that no, it's not inevitable because the majority of people that are educated will clean, drain, and dry their watercrafts. And they will take prevention methods because they, they love the water bodies that they recreate at. Um, and, it, and as resource managers, it's important to us to protect those resources. So um, in the West, we actually have a watercraft inspection and decontamination data sharing system. And this has been in place for roughly three years. And this map on the right shows you in, two, in 2020, all the locations that were using this data sharing system. And so here's how it works. Here's one of my technicians on the left and she has a tablet. She has an app on that tablet she will open. And then for every watercraft inspection or decontamination they do, they enter that information. And so they're gonna be collecting information like where was this watercraft last launched? How long has it been since it, it was launched? Um, and then she's gonna inspect that watercraft and document anything that she finds, any risk factors. And additionally, in that, in that tablet, if she finds some risk factors that trigger a decontamination, she will document that decontamination in that tablet as well. She's gonna hit save, and then at the end of the day, she'll go and connect that tablet to Wi-Fi. It will suck that data into the, the cloud and that data will then be um, available for all the other states and entities that use this system. And so additionally, when she hits upload, it's gonna download all the data from that day that other people have entered into the system. So it's a really cool um, system that allows us to enter a, a watercraft registration number and it pulls up for that boating season, any other inspections or decontaminations that watercraft has experienced. So the first thing these inspectors, when they hit search, it will say, hey, this boat was last out Lake Powell, which has zebra mussels, quagga mussels, whatever you know AIS there is at that water body. Um, you need to pay attention to me um, versus if it was you know like two months ago, maybe that's a less uh, concern. So it's a really um, great system that, that is being in, used in the Western United States. Uh, next slide, please. So research, um, research is really important. So like um, Kim was talking about, unfortunately, we don't have a silver bullet to kill zebra and quagga mussels in an open water setting. I'm hopeful in the future I can tell you we do, but we don't right now. Um, we do have um, a copper-based product, Earth Tech QZ, that when we have a new infestation, let's say at a boat launch, we found a you know, boat launch area, we found a new infestation of zebra mussels. We can put that copper product there 
and kill that that you know kind of centralized infestation but if we have a widespread infestation in an entire lake these products are less effective at killing 100% of the zebra or quagga mussels. And that's important because when we think back to their reproduction, a single female having a million eggs, um, if, if you don't kill all of them, they'll come back. And so um, Earth Tech QZ is a great um, tool we have that can knock back populations, uh, but it can't eradicate them. So other things we're looking at in the lab would be other pathogens that um, are found where these guys are native to in Ukraine and Russia and, and testing to see would that kill them and would that hurt anything else? And so that's one of these biological controls where we, we are, do rigorous test, testing in the lab to say, okay, if we were re to release this in a lake, would we have any impacts on other fish species, other you know invert species, other aquatic species? So um, lots of testing being done in the lab and field trials as well. And so we're just not there yet. Hopefully in the future we are. So it's all about prevention. Prevention is so important because we don't have any any cure right now um, to treat a lake to, to kill a big infestation. The other exciting thing is environmental DNA. And so this was actually this past weekend, um, went out and did some eDNA sampling. And so when I talked to you about those plankton nets, which we're throwing out and we're pulling them back in, and that's filtering gallons of water to find that needle in a haystack, this eDNA is extremely sensitive. And so it's exciting to think that we could use a, a pump and a tube and filter a certain amount of water and then take the, the filter on the end there by the, by the blue piece and do PCR DNA analysis on it to detect dry sun and mussels early on. So eDNA is very promising. We're still in the phase of, of tooling it to make sure we know what's, what um, amount of water to be filtered, how many sites need to be filtered on certain water body sizes. Um, but in the future, it might be more affordable and we will actually have it hopefully drilled in so that we could even more quickly and more early in the process detect zebra and quagga mussels versus using plankton nets. Next slide, please. So some of you may have heard of moss balls and zebra mussels. This was something that came up in March. Um, in, early, in the first week of Mar March, um, in Seattle, Washington, there was a Petco worker who identified a zebra mussel on a moss ball. And if you're not familiar with the moss ball, they're circular, they're pictured on the bottom left here. Um, if you look at the little submarine, yep, exactly. So they're, they're little balls and they're actually not a moss at all. They're filamentous algae and they're grown in the Ukraine um, and Eastern Europe and also in J Japan. And the problem with that is those are also locations where zebra mussels are native and growing and living in the same water body. So, Unfortunately, we had been bringing in moss balls to sell at Petco, PetSmart's, other nurseries and pet stores, um, specifically to be put in, in um, fish bowls with betta fish is one way they were sold, but then also they put them in freshwater aquariums. And the problem with the freshwater aquariums is then we got zebra mussel larvae in all of those aquariums. Um, so this became a really big deal really quickly in the beginning of March. We had never seen something like this, frankly, in the AIS world where we had a, um, a, a AIS species that was coming into uninfested states. I showed you that uninfested West. Well, potentially zebra mussels have been in those uninfested West, Western states for a long time, um, potentially a year or so in people's fish tanks. And so um, the good news is that, you know, all the AIS coordinators are in very good, con very good um, communication with Fish and Wildlife and other agencies. And so immediately emails and calls occurred and said, hey, we found a zebra mussel in Seattle, Petco. Um, within the next week, all of the states went to their, their Petcos and PetSmarts and so did Canada, and they started finding zebra mussels in their moss balls. And so it ended up after we kind of did this, this um, search of all the Petcos and PetSmarts and, and pet stores, that 41 states were found to have moss balls with zebra mussels and nine provinces and territories. So we had a big problem. And one of the biggest things that was happening was USDA APHIS is who at our borders is in charge of inspecting plants to allow them in the country. Now, the problem is they don't have any jurisdiction over a zebra mussel. They have jurisdiction over a plant to make sure that that plant is the correct plant of what's listed on the shipping manifest, for example, or the permit. So they have phyto um, permits. And so they would look at that permit and say, yep, it looks like that's the right species, you're a go. And so they were just coming in. Um, so as soon as this happened, the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, went to the distribution center at the border 
um, in California where this was coming in and started a very um, extensive um, investigation to find out, you know, throughout the United States where these were coming in and then to work with APHIS to um, inspect all those moss bowls, redirect them back um, and so forth. And so um, I'm happy to report that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and, and APHIS are working very closely now at the borders. They're only allowing moss bowls into two different locations and so they can um, look at them every time they're coming into the United States um, and, and take care of them. And then AIS coordinators or aquatic invasive species managers in your states, um, many of your states have laws that prohibit the, the possession or the, the move or the trap, the possession or the transport of zebra mussels. And so they have state laws that their law enforcement has also been investigating on this. So if you have more questions about moss balls, I have a lot of information on my website. And uh, Zach, if you wanna go to the next slide. My uh, website is anyinvasives.com. So please come and the front page will take you right to the moss ball page if you wanna learn more. Um, also lots of information on other invasive species of concern. And my information, my contact information is there as well if you'd like any more information. So with that, thanks Zach and everybody and I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thanks Allison. Um, Kim, if you're able to, you could, uh, could you turn your camera and mic on too so we could do some questions, please? Awesome, there we go. Um, so I'm just gonna leave this page up for now, but I'll roll through some questions. But first of all, I wanna say thanks to Kim and Allison. That was, those are a couple great presentations. I am not admittedly not super familiar with this world, so I learned a lot and uh, hopefully the audience took some good stuff away. Um, we've got some questions. I'll start with uh, one for Kim. Somebody asked if there's any updates on the use of pheromones to stop Asian carp from moving up a river. Uh, Australian biologists were doing some work on this several years ago. Um, there has been some work. I think there's still ongoing um, USGS. So pheromones are you are being used to um, bring them together. So um, it, it you know it doesn't kill them or anything, but all minnow species kind of have use pheromones to, to congregate. And so um, there is some work, what pheromones would be used for is to make the Asian carp come together in one location so that it'd be easier to harvest or remove them from. So there is still some work going on. I haven't heard many updates about that since then, um, but yeah, that is something that's still being worked on. Cool. Um, try to keep it even and go over to Allison. Um, somebody asked, so you, you had the slide talking about um, cyanobacteria and um, the mussels. So somebody asked, why are cyanobacteria not filtered by these mussels? Are they too small? Very good question. Um, so these mussels are tricky because they don't like, they can, they can sense that it's toxic. And so that's one of the problems we're having with finding a method to control these guys because they will they will taste something and say, no, that's toxic and spit it right out. And so that's why a lot of these chemicals that we've tried in the lab don't work because they sense that it's toxic and they spit it out. Um, so so they're just smart and they, they don't eat it, unfortunately. Damn. Tricky. Tricky. Yeah. Um, Somebody asked a question for you, Kim, about um, what is the feasibility of harvesting uh, the carp to be processed into fish emulsion fertilizer? And is there any market for this? Um, so I'll just, uh, you know, address harvest in general. So harvest as a control right now, um, we're really only getting a particular size of fish, so the bigger ones. Um, so there's always little ones that are still reproducing. So it's currently not a method to like eradicate them at all. Um, there, I don't know the specific process for turning them into fertilizer. I know that there are some issues with, because Asian carp are filter feeders, there's potentially contaminants within their bodies and flesh that we don't necessarily want as a fertilizer. And so um, that's also sometimes why it's not, you know, used as pet food or things. There are certain companies that are working on it, they're slowly developing um, markets for that. Um, we're also trying to develop the food market for it. I mean, I've heard that yeah, China would love to take them, right? Our waters are clean compared to theirs, but they want it 
a really fresh product. And so how do we harvest them here and get a really fresh product there? Um, there there's not a lot of funding for that type of thing. And that's one of the things that these industries are asking for is some money for startup programs to try to utilize Asian carp a little bit more. So hopefully that answered the question. I think so. Um, back to you, Allison. Somebody's asking, uh, is there anything I can attach to my boat in Lake Erie to prevent the zebra mussels from getting into my engine? Yeah, so there there is a muscle master, and so feel free to send me an email. Um, there are some caveats with that, and it depends on, on the type of boat you have, but please email me. There is there is a product that is actually a filter that you can put on your watercraft, and it will prevent um, those, those velgers from actually coming into your boat, um, but it can't be used on all watercrafts, and it also depends on um, kind of the water body you're using, because if it if it has a lot of debris, then it could get clogged really quickly. So please just send me an email, and I'd be happy to send you that information. Great. Um, I have a question of my own for uh, either or both of you. <clears throat> and I know some of our audience mentioned that they were SOS monitors, and so we monitor for aquatic macroinvertebrates. Uh, many of them are filter feeders as well in their larval stage. And so do you guys know um, I would imagine there would be impacts to the macroinvertebrate populations from these invasive species as well. Do you guys know anything about, the, about that? Yeah, I, I don't, but, but you're right. If they're, they're filter feeders too, I, I would guess that there's less um, plankton available. But, you know, and the Asian carp in particular are taking the plankton from the water column, not necessarily from below, because they actually... They rise at night mostly and swim at the surface with their mouths open, but the zebra mussels are at the bottom. So I, I would guess, and Allison can chime in too, that there would be some impacts. I don't know that anyone's ever studied that though, really. Right. Might have a potential project on our hands then. Yes, there you're right. Yeah, Absolutely. You document, yeah, declines in invertebrates in a location where there's zebra mussels. That would be that would be yeah. really cool. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of our, our macroinvertebrate monitoring is aimed at smaller. Uh, knee deep in shallower streams so i don't know if we would have um probably not the carp so much but maybe mussels in the moving water um that's interesting uh so we've got a question for kim about the carp somebody's tom says i have heard that a lake in virginia has introduced sterile grass carp to eat outbreaks of eurasian milfoil if they're an invasive species how is the sterilization process controlled okay so yeah so um Grass carp are legal still in um, seven states that anybody can introduce them. And, um, so the grass, they're, they're sterilized, they're, they're triploids. They're made to be a triploid. So if you get into genetics and stuff, a triploid right after you know birth basically. And so they're not able to reproduce. And so, um, because uh you know some people you know chemicals can be used to control vegetation grass carp are seen as a biological control so depending upon your state they are or they aren't an invasive species that's why i didn't really address it today because in iowa they're actually legal minnesota they're completely illegal so it, it it gets tricky but the reason that people are wanting to use them is because they're more biological versus a, a chemical control and they are completely um you know they they have to be tested each individual test each individual fish is tested to ensure that it's a triploid fish before they can be stocked so they they truly um should not be reproducing as long as they are a certified batch of triploid fish but there can be illegal stockings so <laughs> it's true it uh Make, it reminds me of Jurassic Park. <laughs> exactly. <You never know. laughs> um, all right, I've got one last question on here uh, for Allison. If you guys have any other questions, go ahead and submit it. We've got a couple minutes, but uh, otherwise this will be the last one. So somebody asked, are manufacturers making any modifications to wake boats and other recreational watercraft to allow for com complete drainage of ballast water? Yes, great question. Um, so the ABYC or the Amer American Boat and Yacht um, Commission 
and again, you can send me inform your information if you want more, but ABYC, put it in Google and say boat, you know, and AIS. Um, they have a whole video that talks about the research that they're doing and the modifications that they are doing to wakeboard boats and ski boats to make them easier to decontaminate. And so um, specifically with the wakeboard companies, um, I've heard that we, we haven't been as successful in getting them to kind of change, make a lot of modifications because of course those are really expensive designs and um, I've heard that we had some struggles there, but but with the boating industry largely, um, they're very open to redesigning and making changes to make decontaminations more effective. And then of course, Western states are doing a lot more outreach to wake borders. Um, one one cool thing is that in Utah, they just installed a dunk tank, and so they can actually decontaminate a wakeboard boat in three minutes and 38 seconds. So if you go to Google, type in Utah and dunk tank. Um, really cool video, very exciting um, that that's a new tool that they'll have and they can decontaminate up to 50 wakeboard boats a day in Utah. So um, something really cool that they're piloting there and that maybe many of us will have in the future if we have those funds to do that. So um, Kim, did you have anything to add? No, I was just going to say, I mean, the ABYC has been a great industry partner. They understand aquatic invasive species and the need and, and a lot of their boat manufacturers. Um, so that's been a really neat thing to to see. Um, and there'll be more stuff in the future. Like Allison said, they're they're working on a lot of different things to try to, to help us out. Awesome. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of uh, new technology and research going on. Figure out what we can do about it, about these guys. Um, so that concludes our questions. The last question that came in asked if a recording will be available. Uh, the answer to that is yes. So this was recorded. Uh, you should get a link to a YouTube video sometime next week uh, when our communications person is back in the office. Uh, so just keep an eye on your email inbox for a link to that video. But other than that, that's one minute past our hour. So I'll thank everyone in the audience. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hope you guys took something away from our presentations today. I know I definitely did. Um, and then obviously thank you to Allison and Kim for uh, joining us today and for your great information and putting the time in to make this happen. So I really appreciate you guys and I'm sure the audience does as well. Thanks uh, for having me. Yep. Thanks yeah. everybody. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a great weekend. Thanks Zach. Yep. Thanks Zach.